Hi guys, Ian Johnson from DriveSuccess.com. Today we're going to talk about an essential aspect of lean manufacturing. We're talking about cycle time analysis, or more importantly, cycle time variance analysis. And the goal today is to show you guys how you go about identifying your benchmark cycle time in a given work cell, workstation, um, you know, or across your entire shop floor. And your benchmark cycle time is that cycle time with the least amount of downtime, uh, the least amount of work stoppages, it's the ideal cycle time. It's the one you want to attain as often as possible. Um, now, the reason why I do a cycle time analysis is because it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, managing production <laughs> via an Excel spreadsheet or timesheets, a very manual process, or if you're using a real-time data tracking uh, mechanism like an MRP system. In fact, for companies that use MRP systems, what they end up doing is they end up taking their cycle times as doctrine. And there's no system anywhere in the world that is intuitive enough to tell you what your cycle times should be. All your MRP system can do is tell you what they are right now. In order to lower your cycle times, you know, uncover loss capacity, or increase your production throughput, in order to perform that cycle time analysis, you've got to see production happen in person. So the goal today is to show you how to do an analysis, how to define your benchmark cycle time, and then track it through your MRP system in terms of tracking your variances against that ideal cycle time. So I've got three aspects I want to cover today. Number one, I want to basically explain the background of these cycle times, give you an idea of what, what, what's included in these times. Then I want to show you guys, you know, three methods of determining average, okay? And everyone thinks that average is just taking everything inside the sample portion and divide it by the number of operations, and that's actually not a good idea. That's what we associate as average, it's called the mean, and when you do that, you basically come out with an inflated number. I'm going to explain why that's not a good idea by showing you how to do mode and median cycle times in terms of the analysis, okay? And then the third thing I want to cover is this graph that I have up here. Now, this graph has basically, you know, a very simple representation of cycle times from these 10 operations that are in this table up here in the first step. And what I've got is I have graphed out these cycle times and this dotted green line, and I hope you all can see it, is the, what we would term or what we would assume to be our benchmark cycle time. So this is a great tool, and a link has probably popped up above my head. Um, this, all of this information is from the sample Excel spreadsheet that's above my head right now, and it's on my website. And if you click on that link, you'll be able to analyze a given work cell, and there's an Excel spreadsheet where you can capture the causes of downtime for each cycle time. Uh, and then you can input the cycle times into, a, into the table. It'll calculate mean, mode, and median cycle times for you. And it'll graph the cycle times and show you these cycle times against the variance. Okay? So it's great. You can basically identify high and low variances within your analysis. So very quickly, these cycle times up here, there are only 10 of them. It's only 25 minutes of a three-hour analysis that I might do on a single eight-hour shift. So what I've done is instead of putting up hundreds of numbers up here, I've condensed it down to 10, okay? So when I do an analysis, you know, there's a lot more than just these numbers. I usually, you know, I don't just do it with one operator on one shift. I basically scale it. And what I try to do is I, I mix it up with multiple operators or multiple shifts. And it's often very easy to do when you're working with a company that, that runs one or two shifts a day. So I like to see different operators in the same work cell and try to come up with, a, with an ideal cycle time for both of them, okay? So what I've done here is basically these times do not include any tack time, they do not include setup time. So for those of you that are, are um, Six Sigma certified or black belts in Six Sigma, uh, please understand this does not include tack time. I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can. The setup time and all the other stuff has been done, and these are cycle times for, a, for an individual operation in terms of start and stop, okay? So 2 minutes and 30 seconds, 2 minutes and 30 seconds, 225, 230, 245, 255, 215, 325, 330, and 250. Now let me show you why it's wrong to just use an average and say that that's our benchmark cycle time. When you calculate average, which is basically the mean, you total up all of these numbers inside the sample portion and you divide it by the number of operations. If you were to do that, it's 25 minutes, you divide it by 10, and you're going to come out with 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Okay? So some companies would say, well, you know what, we see 250 quite a bit. That's, that's basically our average because it's the average of everything. Let's try and get to 250 as often as possible, or let's try and lower it to 240 or 245. But if they decide that that's their benchmark cycle time, instead of actually raising the bar, they've lowered it. And let me show you why. Okay? The mode cycle time, okay, or the mode in terms of the average, 
is the number that appears most often in the sequence. So 2.3, 2.3, and 2.3, and no other number uh, other than maybe 2.15, which is 2 minutes and 15 seconds, appears. So the mode time is 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Okay? That's another way of calculating average. The median. When you calculate median, you have to restructure the entire sequence. And you've got to go from the lowest value to the highest. So you see the last cycle time was 215. That's the 10th, the 9th, the 8th, and the 7th was 215. So I'm going to restructure it, and I'm going to put the lowest values first, working my way up. So I go 215, 215, 225, 230, 230, 230, 245, 255, 325, and 330. The calculation is very simple. You take the number of operations, which is 10, you add 1, and you divide it by 2. So in this case, it would be 11 divided by 2 is equal to 5.5. Now, the answer is not 5.5. It's not 5.5 seconds, or 5 minutes and 50 seconds. That's not your benchmark cycle time. What you're doing in this case is you are locating the number that is between the fifth and sixth number. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, right here, it's 2 minutes and 30 seconds. So, again, it's 2 minutes and 30 seconds. So, now it becomes very obvious why just going with average does not work. Okay? In this case, if you were to tell you know, your operator that you want him to get as close to 250 or get it as often as possible, you'd be ignoring the more accurate number of 230 and 230. Okay? And consequently, this dotted line right here is 230. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule in terms of when you analyze these cycle times and you come up with a benchmark, but more often than not, a lot of times your mode and your median, these are the cycle times that have the least amount of downtime. If you're looking at a work cell, the number that comes up the most often in the sequence should be the one that is the closest to your ideal. You should be always striving towards getting that ideal cycle time. But what you want to do with this graph, and what's, what, what, what is really good about using that sample Excel spreadsheet that this is drawn from, is it allows you to capture the causes okay, of the work stoppages. And you can capture them for each an individual operation. Now, you're going to come across cycle times that are perfect. There's no downtime, there's no nothing. And the goal here is not to beat your, your operators over the head about not always getting this 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Instead, it's to understand why you have certain periods where you have, you know, 3 minutes and 25 seconds and 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Why are these cycle times happening? What are the causes of these high cycle times? How often does it happen per shift? How often does it happen per week? And how much is that costing you in terms of loss capacity? So cycle time analysis, you know, it can be very complicated in terms of, you know, Six Sigma. There's a lot of very involved calculations. But in the end, it's about understanding what your ideal cycle time is. And in order to do that, you've got to see production happen in person. Okay? You've got to see it happen in person, and you've got to continuously go back. It's not a static, it's not a one-time uh, you know, test. You've got to continually go back and try to improve things. So that's it. Lean Manufacturing Cycle Time Variance Analysis. Ian Johnson, DriveSuccess.com. Bye-bye.